with over 50 legendary creatures from Outlaws of Thunder Junction, I'm going to point out the three most unique commanders to build around right now. Hey everyone, my name is DJ. This is the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel and Outlaws of Thunder Junction has a ton of amazing commanders, but there are three that I'm particularly excited about because they open up a completely new archetype. They explore new and interesting ways to play the game. And I think that these deck techs are gonna be phenomenal. The first commander I wanna talk about is the Gitrog, Ravenous Ride. The Gitrog, Ravenous Ride is three black green for a six five legendary creature, frog, whore, mount. Trample, Haste, whenever the Gitrog Ravenous Ride deals combat damage to a player, you may sacrifice a creature that saddled it this turn. If you do, draw X cards, put up to X land cards from your hand on the battlefield tapped, where X is the sacrifice creature's power. Saddle one. Now the Gitrog monster overlaps a couple different strategies. Um, Golgari aggro, sure, that kind of exists. Uh, Landfall decks, of course that exists in Golgari, and power matters deck. Green loves increasing the power of things. But when you mesh all of those together, you really get something uh, beyond the sum of its parts. I think the thing that we're gonna wanna focus on is big powered creatures that can saddle or crew, I might say crew a couple times, but saddle the Gitrog and then sacrifice themselves so you can draw a bunch and dump a bunch of lands. Yargul and Multani is gonna be insane. It's an 18-6, Demogoth Titan an 11-10, Rotting Registar is seven power, Galta is 12 power, Normal Yargul is nine power. I also think that uh, creatures that are as big as your land count could be really good, especially if we're dumping a bunch of lands on the battlefield. So Multani, Yavimaya's Avatar, or Cultivator Colossus, those play well with the land synergies as well. If you wanna go all in and have as big a power as possible, you can get some of the problematic creatures like uh, Phyrexian Soul Gorger, Lupine Prototype, or, you know, uh, pugnacious hammer skull. Like the, all of those have like big downsides to them, but they really have big power too. So you can just immediately draw and dump as much as possible. I think I like a little bit more of the balance strategy because I want the backup plan of just being able to have big creatures and big ramp cards like Zop and Drill or Unnatural Growth, uh, they can sort of make my normal size creatures uh, really big and make my Gitrog even bigger too. Because remember, it's got a smash in as well. This isn't just an aggro deck where you turn big creatures sideways. I really like the landfall aspect of this as well. Uh, being able to hit land drops really consistently, dump lands on the battlefield, and then weaponize those lands too. Not only play bigger things later on the game, Game, but just get advantage out of every landfall. That's why I like Obnixilus the Fallen. Just three damage and get Obnixilus even bigger with each land is fantastic. How about Greensleeves, Morrow Sorcerer? Not only is this gonna get really big based on your lands, but it's also gonna create badgers, adorable little badgers too. Or, or solid things like Scoot Swarm, man. Just being able to play a Scoot Swarm and then you just mass out a bunch of them, go super duper wide. And of course, this can be supplemented with strategies like Lotus Cobra, Tireless Tracker, Tireless Provisioner. Actually, Tireless Provisioner has sort of a, like a strategy in my mind. Uh, it's a three drop that will help me get to the Gitrog on a turn early, which is really, really good. Um, but also it's a creature that isn't uh, embarrassing to saddle it up. Um, better versions though are Topiary Stomper and Wayward Sword Tooth. This is a four power and a five power. Yeah, these three drops will saddle really well, refill my hand and dump a bunch of lands on the battlefield. That's the kind of curve I'm looking for in this deck. And then once we've dropped a bunch of lands, we can start dropping big creatures. All right, check out the deck list down below. My version is pretty balanced. It's not going too deep into the creatures that are all, all in. It can just like ramp out into a big landfall creature based strategy. And I just think that the Gitrog uh, really heightens that up a little bit. I, I think this is gonna be a really fun combination of aggro, sacrifice, and lands matter sort of all meshed together um, to make something really fun, but also has the ramp and the card draw to just stay in the game for forever, which is a little bit harder for aggro decks. The next commander I wanna talk about lets us explore a different kind of strategy, and that's upkeep matters. Let's talk about Obeka Splitter of Seconds. 
Obeka Splitter of Seconds is one blue, black, red for a 2-5 legendary Ogre Warlock. With Menace, whenever Obeka Splitter of Seconds deals combat damage to a player, you get that many additional upkeep steps after this phase. <laughs> I always loved playing around with the idea of upkeeps, like uh, Paradox Haze. I tried it in a Xur shell, <laughs> and so that could get the Paradox Haze onto the battlefield, um, but Xur was too sneaky and powerful, and it just wasn't ever right to get Paradox Haze. Uh, I really like the idea of just getting multiple upkeep triggers, and so you can synergize and play with the best upkeep cards in the game. A cycle that's one of my favorite is the Court Cycle. Uh, these are enchantments that give you the Monarch, which, by the way, incentivize other people to attack around getting the Monarch, which opens up lines of attack for your Obeka. But they also give you a little bit of advantage every single turn, like Court of Ambition. Uh, during your upkeep, each opponent loses three life unless they discard a card. If you're the Monarch, they lose six life uh, unless they discard two cards. Uh, Court of Embrith. Uh, you again, you become the monarch. Beginning of your upkeep, create a 3 1 red knight creature token. Then, if you're the monarch, it deals X damage to each opponent where X is the number of creatures you control. Court of Vantress. Again, you become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose up to one target enchantment or artifact. If you're the monarch, you may create a token that's a copy of it. If you're not the monarch, you may have Court of Vantress become a copy of it, except it has this ability. Court of Ire. Again, you become the monarch. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of your upkeep, Court of Ire deals two damage to any target, and if you're the monarch, it deals seven damage to that player or permanent instead. A Court of Lockthwain. Uh, this, again, you become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of target opponent's library. You may play that card as long as it remains exile, and mana can be spent as though it were mana of any type to cast it. If you're the monarch, until end of turn, you may cast a spell among the cards exiled with Court of Lockthwain without paying its mana cost. And then Court of Cunning is probably the weakest one. It just has you milling. But you can imagine that these cards just are solid. They sit on the battlefield and they just gain you advantage every single turn. And giving you the Monarch allows you to, number one, dictate sort of the pace of the game, but also just replace them. You immediately get that card draw. That's super duper good. Um, and by the way, you don't need Obeka for these cards to be good. They've been playable already. And so all you have to do is just land these enchantments, just keep going with your game plan and just make sure the game goes long because every upkeep, you're gonna get even more card advantage. A couple of these courts give us card advantage, but I wanna talk about a few others that can do that. Uh, Twilight Prophet is fantastic, giving us a card. Uh, Plarg and Nasari allow us to steal cards. That's such good card advantage. Phyrexian Arena gives us cards. Bone Horde Dracosaur gives us cards, and we can also get huge amounts of mana too. Things like Descent into Avernus gives us a ton of mana. As foretold is gonna let us cast things for free. A replicating ring, we could theoretically just have a bunch of rings always going off. You know, I mentioned how good the Monarch can be, allowing uh, creatures to want to attack, which opens up lines of attack for your own Obeka, but something similar can be done with the Initiative. The Initiative is super sweet, and people are gonna want to gain that initiative. Uh, in these colors, we've got Caves of Chaos Adventurer and Ravenloft's Adventurer. And if you can hold the initiative, then that's gonna trigger in your upkeep. Yes, in your upkeep, so cool. Now, just like in the other strategy, there is one sort of angle in here um, that I've decided not to go down, but you could theoretically do it. Um, and that's suspend counters. Uh, suspend counters come off during your upkeep. And so if you suspend something and you have multiple upkeeps, you can remove a bunch of suspend counters. I think that there are existing really fun suspend um, commanders and cards out there. So I'm not too excited about, you know, going down that road in particular. I really like going heavy on all the stuff that have really cool upkeep triggers, especially the ones that are give, gonna give me card advantage and the ones that I'm gonna want to play anyways. Because as soon as you have a couple of these creatures, a couple of these enchantments, these powerful effects on the battlefield, your opponents are gonna know that it's not okay to let you connect with Obeka. So if you have too much riding on making sure you have multiple upkeeps, then everyone might just fixate on you and fixate on your commander. And that's, that's not gonna be good for your strategy. Um, I also think that as long as you're going long, that this deck's gonna be really good because every upkeep you gain advantage, whether you're manipulating it with Obeka or whether you're just waiting until your next turn. So I wouldn't shy away from things like board wipes. Just, hey, 
I'm just gonna reset the board. Oh, but by the way, I have the Monarch, or I have the Initiative, or I have these cards that trigger during my upkeep. So I wouldn't be, I would definitely run, you know, Blasphemous Act, Toxic Deluge, uh, even Damnation, things like that. All right, and the final deck I wanna talk to you about is Cabal Profiteering Mayor. Cabal Profiteering Mayor is one white black for a 2-4 legendary human advisor. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them create a tap token that's a copy of it. This ability triggers only once each turn. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Kambal can just be the head of a token strategy, and as you get tokens, as you get value, you know, you just drain your opponents. I mean, just imagine some of the most famous and important uh, cards out there. Stroke of Midnight, Generous Gift, Get Lost, you know, all of these are premium pieces of removal that you would run anyways in any black-white deck. But they happen to just give a creature token to your opponents that you then get and you get to drain. Pitiless Plunder, Lotho, and Smothering Tithe, like those treasure creations, are just something I would normally play in this deck. There's also just solid forms of just general token creation that are gonna go really well. Bowmasters, Adeline, Deadly Dispute, like they're just solid cards that we would normally play. So you can build a deck that's just well-rounded, um, leans heavily on tokens so that you can drain your opponents while controlling the board. A fantastic baseline core strategy. But then when you supplement it with those few other cards, those political cards, those cards that donate tokens, it just ramps this deck up and gives it sort of its own unique take. So cards like the Hunted series is gonna be great, like Hunted Bone Brute. It donates uh, two 1-1 one, one white dogs and you get a cool creature. Hunted Horror has you donating two 3-3 three, three green centaurs. Or Hunted Lamasu, a four mana 5-5 five, five flyer, which generates a 4-4 four, four token for your opponent. And remember, you're getting all of these too. Um, the other thing that I really like about giving your opponents things is it creates space for politics, and that really makes the game a lot of fun. Um, remember, if you can give your opponent something and you know for a fact that it's not going to be used against you, then that's a net advantage for a multiplayer game. And in many situations, I'm giving my opponent something in exchange for a favor. You know, so not only am I giving them something that's going to be used against maybe the person that we really want to attack, you know, I know it's not coming towards me and maybe I'm also getting a favor, but then also, you know, I'm getting something out of it too. And I'm getting a copy of that token, like just the value that you can generate when you're playing politics and teaming up against other people is just phenomenal. And there are cards in this deck that can be like really used to advantage. The Hunted series is one. I really like Alliance at Arms. That's gonna create a huge massive amount of tokens and a political situation. Uh, Shadrick Silverquill can donate some inklings, but also pump your team if you have a gigantic board full of tokens. There's a Crow and a Horse, which gives a bunch of 1-1 soldiers. Clack Blade Bridge Troll that gives ghosts. Master of Ceremonies is really great because it creates a political situation. Your opponents have to choose what they're getting. Ox Drover creates oxen for people. Like there are so many niche cards that would normally get see play, but in this deck, you can totally pick and choose and find out the best ones for it. I also think one thing you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to are uh, cards that will allow you to trigger on other people's turns uh, because you hopefully will be able to give someone a token or figure this out on your own turn, but it only triggers once per turn. And so if you can get this trigger on everyone else's turn, you're getting four triggers around instead of just one. So a card like Combat Calligrapher, you know, encourage other people to attack each other and then give them 2-1 Inklings and then you get a 2-1 Inkling and drain everyone else. Um, also, politically encouraging other people to attack will help out a lot because this is kind of a draining strategy. And so we're gonna also implement a lot of aristocrats in here. I think Mirkwood Bats is a particularly good one because it synergizes so well with tokens. Elias Elcor, Corpse Knight, you know, Zulaport Cutthroat, Blood Artist. There's a ton of different sort of drain you strategies. And then of course, if you're gonna be playing with tokens, you can also double up those tokens, like make them a little bit more impactful. Feliz Reverent Medium sees the tokens that you've created and makes a bunch more 1-1 one, one White Spirits. Uh, you can have Mondrak Glory Animus, which doubles up the tokens. Osier Tag Deepest Foundation can triple up your tokens. That's pretty cool. 
benevolent offering for four mana. You give away three spirits, you get three spirits. But of course, when you give away three with your commander on the battlefield, you also get three more. You also have the ability to drain and gain life. Like, it's a lot. I also really like a narrow card like Saw in Half. Uh, destroy target creature. If that creature dies this way, its controller creates two tokens that are copies of that creature, except their base power is half that creature's power and their toughness is half that creature's toughness. Round up each time. Not only can you get your own creature and make two copies of it, doubling up a really good uh, enter the battlefield or leaves the battlefield effect, but you could also do that to your opponent's really good creature. Like, kill it, divide it in half, and then you with your commander create two token copies of that, allowing you to sort of like steal and leverage your opponent's really powerful creature. I also want to point out the phenomenal card, Tombstone Stairwell. Tombstone Stairwell is two black black for an enchant world. It's got cumulative upkeep, one and a black. And then basically everyone gets to create these zombies at the beginning of their turn, equal to the number of creatures in their graveyard. But as they create zombies, you know, they're there, they gain haste, they can attack with them, and then they're gonna go away. With your commander on the battlefield, this is just a huge, just like, amount of damage because your opponents create these zombies, and then you'll create them too, draining your opponents. And then that happens with every single person's turn. Even though the zombies go away, it doesn't matter. It's just the enter and leaves the battlefield triggers that's gonna synergize so well with this. Honestly, I've made a preliminary deck list and it is so long. It's way over 100 cards. There's so many cool things to do with this. Um, I'm gonna give you a very balanced deck. It's going to have a lot of control elements. It's designed to be really good and then leverage a few of those really fun cards, the best of the cards that donate. Combal, Obeka, and Gitrog Monster, all of them back again for really unique ways of playing the game. You should check out these commanders along with all of the cards from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Hey, did you know that I'm a Magic Gathering Ambassador? And this episode is brought to you by Wizards of the Coast. Thank you, Wizards, so much. I got a link in the description if you're interested, but more importantly, check out all our Outlaws of Thunder Junction, go to your local game store, hang out with your friends, play some magic, and have a good old time. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Thanks again to Wizards of the Coast, and I'll see you all really soon.